Well, today is President's Convocation, and I've done this almost 40 times. And in the convocation messages in the past, I've typically followed one of two formats. I've either preached an expository message, which is my normal way of preaching from Scripture, or I've delivered more of an academic paper or lecture or uh, presentation on a particular topic. But today I'm going to do something I've never done before in President's Convocation. And that is I'm going to deliver this message in really more of a seminar format. Many years ago, I was asked to develop a series of materials on the subject of God's call. I did that. It went through a series of, of, uh, of, of uh, uh, revisions over the first several years that I taught it. And it resulted in my book, Is God Calling Me?, which today is still my best-selling book. And I've just been notified in the past two weeks that uh, the publisher wants to do a second edition of that book and to do it in a hardcover format this time because the book seems to have perhaps some longevity and value that may carry on for a while. We're studying in chapel this fall this theme, leadership formation from call to commission. And we're moving from David's experience of call, which you heard read from scripture this morning by Dr. Ferguson, through the early stories of David's life, some of which will be new for you, and then culminating in the commissioning of David as king some years later. And trying to answer this question, how did God form a leader from call to commission? But my task this morning is just the first message, and that is God's call. And I'd like to do that by asking and answering the question, is God calling me? And present something to you that I will conservatively estimate I have done over a hundred times on college campuses and in church services and at collegiate retreats and conferences particularly over the past decade. Is God calling me? Now the subject of God's call is complicated and clouded for at least three reasons. First of all, we have trouble understanding and communicating about God's call because we forget who God calls. You look at me and you say, well, of course God called you. I mean, you're wearing a suit. <laughs> you're a seminary president. You're a 40-year ministry veteran. Look at you. Of course God called you. But this is not who God called. Well, the power is definitely on. And believe me, it worked three times when we tested it earlier. <laughs> and here we go. And so... This is who God called. <clears throat> this is me when God called me to ministry leadership. Greasy hair? Yes, those are the kind of glasses that turned dark in the sun. But notice the really cool contrasting color undershirt peeking out <laughs> from the two-tone gold and red shirt. This entire look was because I thought it was attractive to the ladies. <laughs> Gateway Seminary, this is who God calls. Second, we're confused about the call because we use the word in so many different ways in our culture. And that, trans that confusion transfers over to church. For example, in the culture we say we receive a call on the phone. Or we're called up from the varsity to the junior varsity. We say we call in a bad loan or call for the question in a business meeting, call for a hand of cards to be shown. We call the steps in a square dance. We call a spade a spade and we call the shots when we're in charge. And every one of those uses of the word call is different. When I umpired baseball for 25 years, I could use the word call in three ways in the same ball game. I started the game by calling the managers to home plate for a pregame meeting. That call is a summons. Then during the game, I said ball, strike, safe, out, fair, foul. Those calls were decisions. And if it started raining, I called the game, which meant I sent everybody home. Three different uses of the word in the same context. We import that same confusion into church by describing all kinds of spiritual experiences as calls when they are not. 
God leads and prompts and directs and guides, but those are not callings. For example, God did not call me to preach this message to you today. God prompted us to develop this theme, and God guided us to these uh, subjects, and I think God has led me to develop this material, but he didn't call me to do this today. We need to reserve call with a very specific definition. So we need to understand who God calls, and then we understand the need, uh, the confusion about God's call, and then that leads us to the third reason that call is confusing is we lack a specific definition of call, and so I wrote one. I wrote this definition more than 20 years ago, and I've been using it ever since. Would you read it out loud with me from the screen? It says, a profound impression from God that establishes parameters for your life and can only be altered by a subsequent superseding impression from God. Now, this definition is precisely written, and every word is carefully chosen. And I want to walk you through at least three phrases in the definition. First, a call is a profound impression. It's more than a leading and a guiding and a directing and a prompting. It is a profound impression. It goes down deep. I sometimes say it this way. After all the analysis is done, you ultimately will say, I am called because I know it in my heart. You're called. It's a profound impression. Second, it establishes parameters. Now, I'll illustrate this in a moment uh, with a graphic, but for now, just understand parameters as the brackets that a call places around your life. Calls place brackets. And that means once the brackets go up, Some things are excluded from your life, and some things are included. Some simple examples. If you have answered a call to ministry leadership, that establishes some parameters about who you can marry. For example, you can only consider a marital partner who has a similar call to ministry leadership. You say, well, what about other believers who don't share that call? They're not marriageable partners. You say, if I've answered a call to ministry leadership and I'm the president of Gateway Seminary, does that also have brackets around it? Yes, it certainly does. For example, there are certain things as a seminary president my schedule won't permit me to be involved in. Other things it will. For example, many of you know that for 10 years I was the chaplain of the San Francisco Giants. Why? Because the bracket of seminary presidency permitted that to happen. Do you know what prohibits that from happening? The bracket of a local church pastorate. You can't miss 18 Sundays to be a seminary chaplain. So when I say it establishes parameters, a call puts up brackets around your life. And some things are included or excluded and some things are included just because of the call. And third, a call can only be altered by a subsequent, subsequent superseding impression from God. In other words, when you're called, you stay called. It's permanent until God comes calling again. So a call is a profound impression from God which establishes parameters for your life and can only be altered by a subsequent superseding impression from God. Now, in my study, I've discovered that there are three types of call experiences. I'm preaching for 30 minutes, what I sometimes take two hours to present, so I'm going to go quickly through some of this, but this What I'm about to teach you rests on uh, more than a decade of studying the call experiences in the Bible and reading multiple books on the subject and then teaching it for the past 20 years. Three types of call experiences. A universal call to Christian service and growth, a general call to ministry leadership, and a specific call to a ministry assignment. Now I'll talk about more, each one of these three in more detail. The first one is, a, uh, first of all, these brackets again help you to see how this looks graphically with these brackets placed around your life. Notice that each one gets a little larger and a little more restrictive as you go along. I'll, I'll show you more about this perhaps in a moment. The first type of call experience is a universal call to Christian service and growth. Now, there are two ways that this, <clears throat> there are two examples I'll give you of how this word call is used this way in the Bible. The first one is Ephesians 4, 1 to 3. The Bible says, walk worthy of the calling you have received. That context is a context of Christian service. Walk worthy. And that passage is addressed to all believers. 
Second, 1 Peter 1.15 says, <clears throat> Be holy as you are called to be holy. Again, that passage speaks to Christian, uh, to Christian growth, or we might say sanctification. So Ephesians 4 speaks to Christian service. 1 Peter 1 speaks to Christian growth. These are examples, not exhaustive, of the word call being used in the New Testament, speaking generally to all believers and giving these two broad instructions, we are called to serve and to grow. The second, when did this happen? It came with your conversion. In the moment you were saved, you received the opportunity to serve and the responsibility to grow. You say, well, I didn't know that happened. I was five years old at Vacation Bible School when I accepted Jesus into my life, and I did not know I was called in that moment to Christian service and growth. Well, a lot of things happen to us that we don't know about in the moment of commitment. Are you married? <laughs> Forty-two years ago, Ann and I stood in front of a Baptist pastor in a Baptist congregation, and we both said, I do, and we had no idea what we were doing. We did not fully understand all the responsibilities that came with the commitment. All right, here's one. How about syllabus shock? You make the commitment to take the class, and then you get the syllabus, and you're shocked because now you found all the responsibility that came with what? The commitment? All I'm illustrating is we make commitments all the time without understanding all the responsibility that comes with them. In the moment of your conversion, you receive the responsibility to grow and to serve. It came with your conversion, and it applies to every Christian. One of the most common questions I'm asked is, are all Christians called? And the answer is, yes, but. Yes, all Christians are called to serve and to grow. So in this sense, all Christians are called. And because of that, this kind of calling can be expressed through any honorable vocation. Now, mafia hit man, that's not on the list, but any honorable vocation. So you may say, for example, I feel called to be a veterinarian or a school teacher or a homemaker or a football coach or an architect. And I have no problem using that language because the Bible says as a Christian you are called to serve and to grow. And if the propensity of your life and direction is toward one of these careers that you find fulfilling and meaningful and an, a an avenue for your service and growth, then I see nothing wrong with, with saying that you feel called to that life. A universal call to Christian service and growth. And may I also say to all of us in this room who mostly have moved beyond this, this is 95 to 98 percent of all Christians. And we need to learn as ministry leaders to teach and celebrate this calling. You do realize in a church of 100, 95 to 98 percent of the people live right here every day. And two to three to five people will have this second experience I'm about to teach you about. The second way call is used in the Bible is a general call to ministry leadership. A general call to ministry leadership. And I choose those words very carefully, and I hope you'll use that language going forward to describe this experience in your life. Now, this type of call is often given confusing titles. What are some of these? Well, <clears throat> this is a common one. I'm called to full-time Christian service. Well, I've already shown you we're all called to full-time Christian service. This is a bad description of this call. Here's another one. I'm called a vocational Christian service. Well, that only works in the southern United States. Most people in the world who have this experience of a general call to ministry leadership don't get a salary, have no medical insurance, don't get a retirement plan. They aren't vocationally employed like we think of ministry as a career in the United States. Do you understand that? Now, I say this often at Gateway, or something like this, if it's biblically true, it has to be true in Seattle, Singapore, Sydney, and Syria. If it's not true in all those places, it's culturally true. So a Syrian Christian who has a, a general call to ministry leadership isn't going to get a paycheck, an insurance plan, and a retirement pl program. Does that mean they're not called? No. It means we're defining call by vocation, and I don't think that's the proper way to understand the call. It's not a call to vocation. It's a call to leadership. And that means that to serve the Lord full time is also a bad title for this. And last, I don't even like this one. 
called to preach. And that's hard for me to say because I calculate I've preached about 8,000 sermons in my lifetime. I've taught preaching at Gateway Seminary as a class. I love preaching. But my call is not defined by a function or a task. It's defined by a role, which is leadership. So the second way call is used in the Bible is a universal call, a general call to ministry leadership. Now, are there is there a biblical model for this? Yes. All believers are called to serve and grow, as I've already said, but few are called to lead. Here's an example, Peter. In John 1, 40 through 42, Peter's brother Andrew led him to faith in Jesus Christ. Peter remained a commercial fisherman for some months afterwards until Luke 5, when Jesus said to him, after today, you're going with me, and we're going after men. You remember that story? That gap is a good illustration of what I'm talking about. In John chapter 1, Peter experienced a universal call to Christian service and growth, and he kept on fishing while he served and grew in his relationship to Jesus. But there came another day when Jesus said, I'm calling you to something else now. I'm calling you to leadership. From now on, you're with me, and we're going after people. Do you see the difference? And do you see the modeling? Third, if you receive a general call to ministry leadership at least once in your lifetime, you will experience this third kind of call. And that is you will experience a specific call to a ministry assignment. I've had four of these in my lifetime. Not counting my early years of being an intern and development years and learning and growing through school. I, I think that's all part of the preparation phase of ministry. But I've had four specific assignment calls. This means that ministry leadership is more than a job or a career, and these roles may change over a lifetime. I was called to be the pastor of Green Valley Baptist Church in 1982. I was called by God to plant a church in Portland, Oregon in 1989. I was called to be the executive director of the Northwest Baptist Convention in 2000, excuse me, in uh, 1994. And in, and in 2004, I was called to be the president of Get now Gateway Seminary. Now, one of the beautiful things in Baptist life about this last call is it can only be fully discerned when someone else invites you. And so, this one often comes with other people saying, we want you to do this for us, and you having to make the decision if God is calling you to this specific responsibility. So, Three ways the word call and the concept of call in the Old Testament is used. A universal call to Christian service and growth, a general call to ministry leadership, and a specific call to a ministry assignment. Now continuing, there are th also three ways God calls. Now, the first one of these is what I call a sudden experience. The second is a reasoned decision, and the third is a prompting of others. And again, let's go through these in some bit of detail. First, a sudden experience, sometimes called a crisis experience. What are some biblical examples of a sudden experience when God called someone? Well, of course, you think of these immediately. There was Moses at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. Another one is Paul on the Damascus Road. This is an Old and a New Testament example for you. But there's one more I want to add to the list because it was also a sudden experience, but it lacked some of the showmanship of a burning bush and a blinding light. That's Matthew at the tax booth. Remember that story? Jesus walked up and said, Matthew, follow me. And the Bible says Matthew got up and followed him. No, bur no bush on fire, no blinding light but nevertheless, a sudden experience. Now, um, I had one of these happen to me. In 1994, I was diagnosed with cancer. I was hospitalized for two surgeries in five days. At the same time that was occurring, I was being considered by the, I was being asked to interview by the Executive Director Search Committee for the Northwest Baptist Convention. This was a crisis of faith for me. Because I misunderstood my calling as a 17-year-old, I thought God had called me to be a pastor, defining it by function, not by leadership. I thought that being a state executive director was leaving my calling. 
And so I was struggling with even the process of being interviewed, and I went into the hospital for my second surgery, and I lay on a table just before the surgery, and I prayed this prayer, God, why is this happening to me? We prayed I wouldn't have cancer, and I have cancer. We prayed I wouldn't have surgery. I'm having two. We, we prayed I wouldn't lose my voice, and now they're telling me I might never speak again. Lord, why are you allowing this to happen to me? And you can read more detail about this in the book, but one time in my life, I believe I heard God speak. And God said to me as clearly as I'm speaking to you right now, Jeff, you belong to me, and I'll take you into and out of what I choose. You don't belong to your, your vision for your ministry. You don't belong to your family. You don't belong to your future. You belong to me. And in that sudden experience with God, he changed the direction of my life forever, and I walked away from pastoral ministry, literally laid on that table preparing to go into surgery and started strategizing my departure from my church and laying out what a life would look like of me spending what I believe to be and has turned out to be the rest of my life shaping and motivating and encouraging other leaders. A sudden experience with God. And then a second way that calling is done in the Bible is what's called a reasoned process or a reasoned decision. Or sometimes I call this a contemplative process. Are there examples of this? Yes. Uh, in the Bible, for example, Paul's Macedonian call is one of these. If you read later, Acts 16, 6 through 10, it reads like travel log, and you'll think it's just filler scripture, but it's not. The Bible says Paul went from province to province, and it uses phrases like this. He said the Holy Spirit prevented him from going. Remember that language? And when you read that and look at a map, you realize those four or five verses took months of walking to live through. This was a reasoned decision, a contemplative process, a walking around Asia Minor, figuratively speaking, rattling doorknobs, looking for where he was supposed to be. And another one is Paul's call to Rome. In 1921, Acts 19.21, Paul said, you're going to Rome. Or, excuse me, God said to Paul, you're going to Rome. And he sat in a Roman prison for two years. And Paul said, I've got to get to Rome. Now, how am I going to get out of here? Okay, I know one way. I'll appeal to Caesar. And he did, and he used a reasoned process to get on a boat to get to Rome where he was supposed to be. Now, has this ever happened to me? Yes. This is how I, this is how I would describe my call experience to be a church planter in, in 1989. I never had a verse glow on a page that said, go plant a church. I never had a, a, a sudden experience with God. I, I never had anybody come to me and tell me you should go plant a church. My wife and I went through a months, months long process of dialogue, spiritual discovery, making charts, pro, con, yes, no, writing all the answers and the reasons. We spent months doing this. And finally, we concluded we believed God wanted us to go to Portland, Oregon and plant a church. A reasoned process that took months, which resulted in a decision that we made. Now, were we praying? Yes. Were we seeking God? Yes. Were we seeking counsel? Yes. But there was never a sudden experience. No bush ever burned. No light ever flashed. We just came to conclude that's what we believed we should do. A third example is the prompting of others. Now, quite frankly, this is the hardest one for me. This will surprise none of you, but I'm rather independent-minded and somewhat pig-headed. And I don't like other people telling me what God told them to tell me. But I found it in the Bible, and now I have to deal with it. And there are two examples in the Bible that I'll show you now where God prompted others to deliver a call message to someone. And the first one, which I will not preach through verse by verse today, but the first one was what Kristen read. This is the story of Samuel choosing David. Samuel showed up and said, I want to see your sons. One of them is going to be king. And they filed by the, the seven sons. And Samuel said, well, that won't work. You got any more kids? So I got, the, I got the young kid. He's out there with the sheep. Bring him in. You're the anointed of God. You'll be king. David's like, I just came in to see what was going on. I, I, I'm, I may be what? <laughs> I don't know how it all went down, but the point is, David was not seeking to be king. He wasn't seeking to be called. He wasn't seeking a responsibility. But God sent Samuel to say, you're the one. Now, did this ever happen in the New Testament? Yes, it did. In Acts 13, 3, there's a verse that says this. Uh, it, the Bible says this. The church at Antioch 
it says, was worshiping the Lord and fasting when the Holy Spirit said, set apart Paul and Barnabas for the work I have for them to do. Now, I've studied that passage in great detail, and I can tell you the passage is pretty clear. The message was delivered to the church, and they told Paul and Barnabas. Now, I've often imagined what that must look like, and I sometimes see it this way. I see John Taylor, our New Testament professor who plays the guitar at faculty retreat every year. I see John up there singing and leading a song in the worship service at Antioch, and he stops and says, does anyone have a word? And somebody stands up and says, well, I do. Uh, Paul and Barnabas are supposed to go on a mission trip. I don't even know what that is. We've never heard of that word before, but that's what they're supposed to do. And John says, let's sing a little more. <laughs> and then he stops, anybody else have another word? And somebody else stands up and said, well, I don't know what a mission trip is. I've never even heard of that. But I think God is telling me to tell Paul and Barnabas they're supposed to go around the, New Test the, New the uh, Mediterranean world and plant churches like ours here in Antioch. And Paul and Barnabas are sitting there like, But the, word, the scripture is clear. God told them in the church to tell the leaders to get on the road. All right? Now, has this ever happened to me? Well, this is the one that I've been the hardest uh, to deal, that was the hardest for me, and it happened the latest uh, in terms of the process. But it did. When I was first asked if I would become, be, inter be willing to interview to be the president of Gateway Seminary, um, I said yes, but I said yes because something had been happening that I had never told anyone about. From the time that Dr. Bill Cruz announced his retirement until the time that the committee contacted me, that was from the spring until the fall, about a four to five month time frame, I had 10 different people come to me. And, and I don't mean the weird kind of people that come up to you after church and say, God told me. I don't mean those kind of people. I mean, I had 10 people, substantial people, iconic people, people that I, in some cases, respected as much as any person alive. I'll just tell you one. Clint Ashley was the director of the Northwest Campus of Gateway Seminary, and by the way, his memorial service is this Saturday. Clint Ashley was the director of the Northwest Campus of Gateway Seminary. He was a deacon in the church where I was the founding pastor. He had been the president of the Canadian Seminary and had left that to come be the director of our campus in the Northwest. He was a giant of a man spiritually. He called me one morning at 940 and said, hey, Jeff, I need to see you today. I said, walk down here. We're in the same building. We go to the same church. He said, I want an appointment. I looked at the clock. It was 940. I said, come at 10 o'clock. He said, I'll come at 10 o'clock. Clint Ashley walked down the other end of our building where I was at one minute till 10. He knocked on my door and walked in. He's wearing a suit. And he sits down across from my desk and said, I've come to ask you a question and to tell you something. I said, all right. Clint said, the question is this. If the search committee from Gateway Seminary contacts you and asks you to interview to be president, will you at least talk with them? And I said, well, Clint, I've been thinking about this. And if they do contact me, yes, I will. I will interview with them. And, and, and it happened just like this. Clint visibly exhaled like this. <sighs> and then he looked up and said, Jeff, God is calling you to be our president. You must interview and you must say yes. Nothing like that had ever happened to me before, but I had 10 of those conversations in a four or five month period. And every one of them ended this way. I said, have you talked to anyone else about this? Or has anyone else, have you said anything to anyone? And all 10 people said, no. In fact, I feel weird even talking to you because I don't do the God told me thing. But I'm here because God told me to come and talk to you. <laughs> now, let's do something I've done literally dozens of times. I would say hundred or more, but I've done this dozens of times. And I want to show you something right here in this room right now. All right, most of you in this room have experienced what I call a, what I describe as a general call to ministry leadership. I'm not talking about your conversion. I'm not talking about your call to your current assignment. I'm talking about the moment when you knew God was calling you to ministry leadership. Now, you may have defined it differently. You may have called it a call to vocational service or a call to preach. We're not getting into that. You, you now know what I'm defining. Everybody with me? Think about the moment that happened to you. Now, I just want you to raise your hand. 
If you had to pick one of these, and I know some of these things kind of blend together, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But if you had to pick just one of these to put it in a category, would you say your call to ministry leadership was more of a sudden experience, a reasoned decision, or a prompting of others? Let's take a show of hands. If you were called in your call to ministry leadership by a sudden experience with God, would you just raise your hand? Look around the room now. Keep them up. Okay, put them down. If you had what you would more likely call a reasoned process, which led you to your general call to ministry leadership, raise your hand for the reasoned process. Look around the room. Okay. Now, this will surprise you. If you're primarily called to ministry leadership today because of the prompting of others, because of believers who came to you and said, God is calling, would you raise your hand? Look around the room. It's a little light on that today, quite honestly. I've done this survey dozens of times. It's almost always a third, a third, a third. And that surprised me when I first started doing it. How many people had been prompted by others as the primary way that God called them to ministry leadership? Well, today. What I've tried to help you to see today is what causes confusion, what types of call experiences are described in the Bible, and the ways that God calls. Now, as I said, these last ways are not, are not concrete silos. These, these are categories with soft edges. Even in the Bible, there's a good example of this. Paul went through a long reasoned process at the end of Acts 16, but what happened at the end of that long reasoned process? He had a vision of the Macedonian man, a sudden experience. So sometimes they, they flow together, and that's okay. That's okay. But here's what's essential. What's essential is that you come to grips with the reality that God has called you. And then if he's given you a call to a specific ministry assignment, that you're settled on that. And then to, that until a subsequent superseding experience happens, that's where you're going to be. And you're going to be there whether it's easy, whether it's hard, whether it's lucrative, whether it's not. You're going to be there whether people like you, whether they don't, whether they criticize you, or whether they praise you. You are going to be there, faithful, stalwart, rugged, because you are called. Now, this may also happen to you today. I delivered this message at California Baptist University to hundreds of high school students at one of their events. A young girl that I've known since she was a preschooler was there as a high school senior. When I finished this presentation, she came down the aisle, tears streaming down her cheeks. She said, Pastor Jeff, well, first of all, that felt like a warm bath. <laughs> Pastor Jeff, I said, yes. Thank you so much. She's crying, I'm thinking, you're welcome. I said, okay, how can I help you? And then she said, I'm not called. <laughs> and I thought, and then she said, oh, you know what I mean. I got the first one. I got the first one. I have a universal call, like you said. And then she said, but my dad's a pastor and my mom's a worship leader. And everybody in my church thinks I'm going to do that. And I'm not because I'm not called. And you've told me today that I can, be a, I can be a public school music teacher. And I can live and serve Jesus right there. And I'm going home from this call conference, not called. <laughs> and she said, and feeling really good about it. Now, I'm not trying to get anyone to leave Gateway, but I am... I am telling you straight up, if you really honestly would have to admit I'm in that first category, just live there. Just live there and be satisfied with the fulfillment God will give you in that category of call. But if you find yourself in that second or third category, then you know what we're here to do. We're here to be called, stay called, and work as God's called people. Get his work done. Well. That's a fast version of two chapters of an eight-chapter book. God calls. That's step one, really. Now, over the next rest of the semester, we're going to move from call to commission. 
And we're going to look at the stories of David's life and what we can learn from them about what they teach us about leadership formation and about becoming the people God wants us to be as we move toward that commission moment when God sends us to do the work we're assigned by him.